Jennifer Chase, Distinguished Scientist and Managing Director Microsoft Research New England and Microsoft Research New York City. Okay. A personal view of network science, promises and perils. Okay, thank you. And now I'm going to speed. I'm going to speed through science instead of through um, cars. Okay. So I'd first like to thank everyone for inviting me here. I have a strong emotional connection to this city because my husband was living in Berlin when we got together, and the first four years of our marriage, we commuted from LA to Berlin. So it was a long commute. Okay, <laughs> and then Microsoft came around and we got jobs together. Okay, so uh, the outline of this is that I'm gonna give you some, uh, uh, some motivation. Then I'm gonna give you a personal view of the promises, some of the research that um, I've been involved in and some of the research that I find very interesting in different domains on networks. And then a cautionary note, an example of some of the perils. Okay, so the motivation is that everywhere we look, we see networks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we model them. So we model networks as graphs, or at least I do, since I'm a mathematician like Martin Greshel. And the different types of networks that I'll mention to you are technological, social, economic, and biological. So let's start with the technological. One is the internet, the AS internet. So these are the autonomous systems that can be walled off, like AOL or MSN or any of the .de domains. They can be walled off, and the edges are the connections among them. Another one is the World Wide Web, in which the vertices are the web pages, trillions of web pages, and the edges are the directed hyperlinks. Yet another one, Hmm. is the cloud data center networks. I think it's um, the people of Germany are especially concerned about uh, energy consumption. All of us should be concerned about it, but the people of Germany seem to be way ahead of the rest of us on this. Uh, I'm not sure if you realize this, but when you do a search, you might think there's you know, no energy involved, no cost involved. This is not true there's a large cost and energy cost involved in that as the computations take place. And right now in the US, 5% of the energy consumption is in the cloud networks, and it is doubling every few years. I mean, it can't continue to double every few years, but uh, we need to come up with new algorithms to improve the allocation of resources for data networks. Okay, social networks. For years, we've been studying offline ones, like epidemiological networks. We saw people looking at the SARS network about a decade ago. We also now, of course, have a lot of online networks, like Facebook and LinkedIn. We also have uh, uh, directed networks, like Twitter. Just because I follow some celebrity, it doesn't mean that they follow me. We have email, instant messaging, mobile phone networks. Some of the work out of one of my labs is a crisis communication network via online networks if there's an earthquake or some other natural disaster. Okay, there are economic networks. Offline, we have things like lending networks, uh, Eurozone, just looking at the different countries and what the connections are. We also have things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, representations of companies and venture capitalists and influentials that we can look at as networks. Online, the AS Internet actually has three different layers. And what happens is that if you're on the third layer, if you're not such an important internet service provider, then you have to pay if your traffic is rooted through the second or the first. Second has to pay if their traffic is rooted through the first. The first never has to pay. So as you look at routing of traffic over the internet, it seems bizarre unless you realize that there are economic constraints operating. Also, for all companies that engage in search, 
as Microsoft does, and also banner advertising. You have networks of advertisers and eyeballs, which are brought to those advertisers online. Biological networks. For years, we have studied phylogenetic networks. Okay, we look at the species that are present today, and we try to infer where they came from. A huge thing, this is a, a lot of the promise of uh, uh, precision medicine, is genomic and proteomic networks in which the way the DNA is regulated leads to an interactive protein network. And there's a picture there of one of the networks that we found when looking at yeast several years ago. Also, neurological networks. So there are all of these connections, neurons in our brain, and, and a very large-scale data problem is how to reconstruct the brain from these individual neurons. People take slices of a mouse brain or slices of a fly brain and try to reconstruct the entire brain from that. Okay, so the motivation for a lot of this is what I call the age of networks. When you look at a picture of a brain cell and a picture of the distribution of mass in the universe, they can look strikingly similar. And this leads one to believe that maybe there is a science of networks which transcends the individual functions. So I'm going to give you a personal view of the promises now. And I'm going to break it up into five types of mathematical and algorithmic problems on networks. The first of those is modeling networks. So if you're going to model something, you must ask, what properties am I trying to model? And for many of these networks that are appearing that are related in any way to social functions, what we find is that they have a small diameter, six degrees of separation. Any person is probably connected to any other person in the world by about six degrees of separation. For example, if I wanted to connect really quickly, I know Bill Gates. So I would connect through him, Bill knows other influentials who are themselves hubs, and then down from there. Even if you don't know Bill Gates, you might know me, so you're one step away from Bill Gates, okay? And then it's just a few steps down. Power law degree distribution. So this is the long tails that, that you've heard about. The probability that I have K neighbors on one of these networks falls off like a power of K, which is actually pretty slowly. And then also vertices that are older tend to have more connections because there's been more time for connections to form. The first model of this is only about 15, 17 years ago, the Barabashi Albert model. It's a rich get richer model. The, it, you, you have certain nodes that are already there. A new node comes in, it attaches to a couple of other nodes, but it attaches with a probability based on how popular those nodes are al already, how many connections they have. Okay, there are more sophisticated versions of this. For example, I'll mention one variant of preferential attachment, which I worked on, which is that you say vertices are born with some fitness. Alta Vista was a search engine that a lot of people connected to way back when. Google was born later, but it has a lot more connections because it was more fit. Okay, so vertices are born with a distribution of fitnesses. The outcome of this is actually, my PhD is in physics, it's a Bose-Einstein condensation. There, there is a website that is born which is so attractive, so fit, that a positive percentage of all future websites will connect to it. This has huge economic implications. Okay, there are various kinds of competition models. There are optimization models, some of which I've worked on. So here a site comes in and it just, um, what it connects to is determined by a variety of factors of the, uh, so a, uh, maximizing a function of what is already there. And then there are fully game theoretic models, which are the most accurate, but the most difficult, in which the websites keep re-optimizing until an equilibrium is reached. The second category of problems is sampling from and machine learning on networks. The World Wide Web is very large, on the order of trillions of sites, so how do we sample from it, for example, to do 
um, ranking of sites for a web engine, for a web search. Uh, this was for dense graphs. A dense graph is a graph in which everybody has a positive probability of being connected to everyone else. Surely not going to happen on Facebook, for example. So newer results cover examples like Facebook. Okay, so it turns out that we would like to ask, how can you take a single snapshot of LinkedIn or Facebook today and learn the network well enough to predict how it will be when it's twice that size? And these graph limits actually are what you need for this. You can get an estimate of the graph limit of Facebook today and predict what it's going to look like. And in fact, we proved a theorem which says that by doing this in a particular way, you can consistently estimate Facebook when it's double the size. Okay, processes on networks. I'll just give you all three of these right away. They come out. Um, on top of this random network, we have random processes like the flow of information or the spread of a disease or viral marketing. Okay, so that's another whole class of problems. One that you may be very interested in is algorithms on networks. The reason you may be interested is that many algorithms have led to the founding of certain companies. Okay, so PageRank was the founding of the company Google. Now there are a lot more sophisticated versions of PageRank, for example, to avoid web spam or to be able to deal with the massive network that the web is today. There are clustering algorithms for collaborative filtering. If you like this, then you're going to like that. Okay, so Amazon tells you what products you might like based on what you've bought. Netflix tells you what you might like on, on the basis of what you've already watched. That is a network algorithm. There are algorithms for multicasting over the web or for web hosting. Akamai was based on a theoretical computer science paper on how to mirror sites to web host. There are fast sublinear algorithms for identifying influential sites if you want to do something like viral marketing over the web. There are also algorithms for recommendation systems. For example, on Facebook, you could gather a recommendation from what your friends are interested in. All of these are very interesting mathematically, but also have economic implications. Finally, there's network reconstruction algorithms. I mentioned phylogenetic network reconstruction. Look at the species present today and infer from what species they may have come, and what evolution has been. Gene regulatory network reconstruction is huge, very important, for example, in cancer, uh, in cancer treatments these days. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. There is, as I said, um, this project to figure out what the structure of the brain is from the neural network. Now, interestingly, we don't even know what types of neurons are in the brain. We know the rest of the body has 200 cell types. The brain, we have no idea how many cell types it has. So another thing you want to do is identify those cell types. And actually, we've been working on both RNA data and morphological data from these brain slices to try to figure that out. And then there's reconstruction of learning processes on, in networks of synapses. Okay, this is how we learn, how our brains learn, also possibly how our brains stop learning and start forgetting when we get Alzheimer's. So this is a very, very important topic to study. I'll tell you a little bit about the network reconstruction algorithms we worked on for cancer genomics and proteinomics. So we developed a very, a very fast class of parallel algorithms for this. And they not only tell us what the network is, but they identify previously unknown hubs in these networks, which could be targets for drugs. So we did this, for example, for brain cancer, glioblastoma, awful brain cancer. It's, it's just you, you almost always die within a couple of years of diagnosis, even if you have surgery and chemotherapy. Four times as many men get it as women. There was no understanding of why. What popped out of our analysis was that the estrogen receptor was very important in this network. 
which gave some idea of why you get it four times as often in, in men. Okay, we also worked on breast cancer. In fact, we used a combination of machine learning and this network analysis, and we were able to find clusters. This is personalized medicine. We found a cluster in which there were already approved drugs that could probably be used off-label for that cancer. So, and this is the very, very tip of the iceberg in this field. Okay, now, I'm going to give you a cautionary note, examples of some of the perils, okay? And again, these are particularly relevant in Germany, where you are much, much more sensitive to privacy than we are in the U.S., okay? And I, I'm much further towards Germany than most Americans, but I'm not as far as my husband. So, you know, you have to be raised in this society to really... Uh, have a deep feeling about privacy. So uh, I'm, I'm going to give you two examples of cases where things can go awry and what we might do to try to fix them. The first one is misidentification of hubs. So there's something called TraceRoute, which is a computer network diagnostic tool that was looking at the AS internet and what the routings are, and why things go very slowly sometimes. So trying to figure out why packets are getting slowed. In 2005, a group of theoretical computer scientists and physicists showed that trace route will identify hubs in networks that have no hubs. Okay, so an exponentially decaying network, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, has no hubs. Trace route will find hubs anyway. Shortly thereafter, I was at a conference in which somebody came along, funded by the Department of Homeland Security, and showed how to use trace route to identify terrorists. Okay, now trace route is fundamentally flawed. It is going to identify terrorists whether or not. It's, it's going to identify people as hubs, whether or not they are actual hubs of the network. Okay, so this is very disturbing. And what it means is, is that we really have to understand these network algorithms, understand when they can and cannot be used so that we don't implicate innocent people. The second, I think, is even closer to the hearts of some of you. It is the revelation of confidential information via connections on networks. So this is really a privacy, pure privacy issue. Sensitive information may be apparent simply due to the connections in our social graph. For example, if you are homosexual instead of heterosexual, um, you can identify that with very high probability just looking at your network in Facebook, okay? So I don't have to know anything about you, but I can, I can guess your sexual orientation, heterosexual or homosexual. Bisexuals will probably get confused on, with, with, this type, with this type of algorithm. But what do we do about that? Well, there's a very nice solution developed by a researcher at Microsoft Research, in fact, a group of them, called differential privacy. And what it means in a network is that whether I am in the network or out of the network, my estimation of any quantity will differ by only some very small epsilon, okay? So you don't know whether I'm on the network or out of the network, which means that you can't tell any properties about me. And we just recently proved that it is possible to consistently estimate. Again, this same kind of consistent estimation I was talking about for Facebook, to consistently estimate network properties on a large class of networks while assuring this very stringent form of privacy. Okay, thanks for your attention.